That was intense. We just went through a time travel portal. You guys feel that? Can everybody just like stand up and stretch for a minute to kind of like get into a new time zone? We're going to do a little time piercing here today as well. So just kind of wave your arms, move your body, twist it back and forth, pull in some of that energy. And yeah, I got about three and a half hours here, so just get, you know, get settled. No, no, I'm kidding. We're doing some time piercing, though. So this 35 minutes is going to take us 4,000 years into history, maybe possibly even uh, 1,300 million years if we get back into the mycelium. So this talk is about reclaiming our lost language of, the, of nature. So what is that? We're going to do a little fractal mapping. And this is this fractal relationships, talking a little bit about this as we go along. But yeah, a little bit about me. I'm known as Herbal Jedi Yarrow from Canada, and I have a great YouTube channel. Check it out. We do a lot of videos on connecting with the natural world, and we just really, I'm just really humbled to be here, hanging out with you. I believe that time is your most valuable resource, so no matter how you got here, the fact that you are here spending time with me, that, that is, to me, the most valuable thing you can do. So our lost language of the natural world, what is that? Well, First thing I'd like to share, how do we go here? That way. Oh, the saddest thing I ever did see was a woodpecker pecking on a plastic tree. He looked at me and friend says he, things ain't as sweet as they used to be. What is this? This is a poem that um, reminds me of something that we, we suffer from in our world. And I'm going to talk about the problem first before we get into a little bit of the ways in which we can work with it. But we suffer from the great human disconnection as a mass society. We have this thing called uh, ADD, no wait, wait, NDD, Nature Deficit Disorder. And I believe that this is the core problem that keeps a lot of us from really reaching our altitude. And I, I mean our attitude is our altitude. And the way we connect with the natural world, the way we connect with ourselves has a lot to do with this. So really I could just say, spend time in nature, we're done, see you later. Now, we'll go a little further. So the problem. We've been sold on this as the language of connection. Oh, a little bit of oxytocin bliss there. They're all hanging out, enjoying it. Quick side note, you know why people eat popcorn while they watch a movie? Anybody know? You heard of a concept called mouthfeel? Anybody heard of it? So there's this whole idea that our taste is actually more closely related to the mouthfeel than it is to the flavor. And the mouthfeel of crunch of that popcorn releases oxytocin in the brain. It makes us go, ah. So why potato chips and popcorn are so popular is because they actually release brain chemistry that we're addicted to, which is that oxytocin rush. So we've been sold on this as connection. The reality is we end up like this, lost in our own version of the netherverse. And I call it the netherverse because uh, it's, it's, it's our own little epicenter that's been custom coded to us that makes us the center of the universe. Uh, in reality, we're not the center of the universe. We're far from it. We may be intelligent, but we're nowhere near the closest to the most intelligent thing on this planet. In fact, we're just a small piece of that. And finding our place within nature is probably the best thing we can do to upgrade our health. And this is my version of biohacking. So I say in the modern age, we, are, we worship the pocket god. Anybody else have a pocket god? So you worship what you spend time with, what you devote your energy to. And when I go to dinner, how many people put their phone on the table? This is my god. Here is me incarnate. So we worship the pocket god. So here's the problem. This is what we're starting with. This is the problem. But I want to take you guys oh, down the rabbit hole. I mean, the donut hole. What? The donut hole? You guys want to come down the donut hole with me? Yes? No? Anybody? You guys ready to go down the rabbit hole? Should I go home? No. Okay. So what if I were to say you're closer to the shape of a donut than a human? What would you say to that? Yarrow, you're crazy. What? And I'm not even talking about like a paleo, gluten-free, superfood, ketogenic donut. No, no, no. Regular donut. You are more closely related to this and we're more closely in the shape to that than you are to human. What I mean is not really like this. We eat our own disease. We eat our own. We are the conquerors and we are the conquered. And the problem here is we lack an ancestral wisdom to guide our actions. So quite often, we spend our life devouring ourselves in that way and living in this kind of ego sense in that sense and we devour nature the same way we clear cut the reality around us so back to the donut and what I really mean I don't really mean you're like Homer Simpson of course you're not we're, we're evolved but electromagnetically you are actually much closer to the shape of a donut you have this 
toroidal field, and you're actually a toroidal field generator. And it's not just you that's a toroidal field generator. All of nature is a toroidal field generator. So you've heard of chakra systems, right? You've heard of um, digestive systems. Well, your digestive system is a modified donut. Literally, when you put food in your mouth, does it go into your body? No, it does not go into your body. It goes into the hole in your donut. And depending on what's in the soil, in your plant or your organism, that's what extracts the nutrients out, right? So very different from when I put food in, it becomes me. It's not, I am not the food I eat. I am the food that my food eats or that my bacteria eats in that sense. So we, we heard about the microbiome of it yesterday. We've heard about this concept probably in our lives before. I just want to bring it to another level of you're actually more like a donut. It's not just you. It's everything. Oh. So our, our, our earth is actually a donut. It's not our sphere. It's an electromagnetic donut. We got two poles, right? Every cell and cell division is like a donut. Every galaxy is built like a donut. The orange, the tomato, the tree, and the human body. So this is kind of fundamentals of the toroidal field generation. Every cell in your body creates this electromagnetic loop. So in fact, in essence, um, the symmetry of nature is really in that toroidal field symmetry. So all life is created like this. Your hand is the same thing. And this is a fractal mapping systems we're going to get into. We're going to get deeper into fractal mapping systems. And the phi ratio, even the ancient Greeks knew this, right? The golden mean. So this is stuff you might have heard. How many of you heard of this stuff before? Sacred geometry, golden mean ratios, fractal geometry, yes. This is, this is, what we've learned is that this is how all life organizes itself. And the original biohack is really getting into the fractal nature of self-similarity. Now, you notice how these Russian dolls, there's something really important. They look the same, right? They don't. They're all self-similar. Each one is unique. Each one is different. So there's a similarity there, but each one has its own personality. Some are smiling, got a little bit of different eyes, a little bit different roses, a little different expression on them, right? So there's a self-similarity there, but there's not the same. And this is why we're not holographic. We're fractal in nature. So I want to take, take you on way back to the fractal mapping systems and interpreting the ancient knowledge hacks. So we're going to go through a whole bunch of slides in the next little bit that are really on old world hacks. This is how we hacked the world before we had this technology and this science. And the last talk was awesome because it gave us a real deep level of how we can hack our current reality with our science. But what I want to take you back to is remember that before we had science, we still had the same kind of brain. We still had the ability to see patterns. We still had the pattern recognition. And this idea of time piercing was something we were very, very astute at observing. But we used the natural world to show us the fractal mapping and the self-similarity of the world around us, right? Like right now, it's fall. And in fall, we're going to go through, what does that mean to our body? It's different, right? When we want to hack our body, we want to go to a different time. So here we go. You know, what, what is fall? Well, we got autumn, and it's old age, and it's bile, and it's earth, right? We're getting down into that energy, into that element, bringing it back down. Anyway, we're going to go through this. And first, I want to just oh, give you a, a concept. And this idea is, is that you can hack your mind, your body, your feeling system just by learning the mapping systems, just by learning the sensory gating channels. Now, this word sensory gating channel, I want you to check this out because Every shamanist, shamanistic society before us had this idea and understanding of what the sensory gating channels were, these, these ways of experiencing the world around us. And right now, we are tuned into only seeing this, right? You don't see in infrared. You don't feel in certain heat signatures. You can't smell the way a dog can. Well, actually, you can start to hack that system a bit and start to feel in those ways. And there's one concept I've been really, really attracted to, and it's just starting with breathing, feeling, and wide-angle lenses. So where I kind of came to this and this realization after all the schooling I did, I'm a clinical herbalist. I spent six years studying herbal medicine and learning the mapping systems of diagnostic techniques. And from there, I just got really intrigued into getting into understanding how these all related to each other because you've got all these different medicine systems. How do they relate to each other? Well, what I learned is that it's actually the turnaround points. This was really key to me. The turnaround points which is the edges of the reality. And that's where we can see the reality most clearest, the furthest from source. And we're going to go into that. I'm going to show you a bunch of maps that kind of talk about that. And wide-angle vision. Instead of looking straight forward at where you want to go in life, 
sometimes taking the peripheral allows you to have more perspective, right? Just like this guy on the side of the mountain, he's getting a lot more clarity in his life just by sitting there having a mindfulness practice. And so it's these turnaround points in the world. And I'm going to show you a few of these, and this is how we can read the world around us, really simply reading these turnaround points. Oh, back we go. So first one I'm going to take you into is star mapping. Stars for a long time were the furthest place from us. We could see. We could see the stars. That was the furthest turnaround point we could. So every society before us had a version of star mapping. And before we get further into mapping, I want to tell you that all of these maps are ways to look for questions to ask deeper of. There is no truth to this. They are all um, inferred ways of looking for better ways to find answers. So I'm not here to give you any answers. I'm here to give you questions on how you can, and ways in which you can look deeper into finding the answers yourself. So we have this idea that no matter what these maps say, say I'm a Sagittarius, That's not, that doesn't define me. That just gives me an inference into what I might want to look for in certain tendencies and questions I might want to ask later, right? So the more maps I learn, the better I have at the ability to be able to decipher the codes of how I show up and where I show up. So every society before us understood that there was a pattern in the stars and there was a pattern in the time signatures. So they all mapped it out in these different ways. And anybody who's gotten deeper into this, each one of these maps goes super deep. Like you look at Chinese astrology and it goes into family lineage, it goes into feng shui, it goes into all these different ways in which your, um, your sisters and brothers might show up and how that affects your family. And so it gets deep. You go into astrology and you see maps that go from Pluto charts where you're like, oh, generational charts. You go into moon charts and they're like every two and a half hours, the moon is flipping signs. So this, these maps shift and they're all uh, a way of perceiving the world. Oh, I keep going backwards. Next, well, next one is um, the meridian channels. Everyone knows about the meridian channels? You heard of Chinese medicine before? I'm sure this is one of the most well-documented types of medicine. Now, 4,000 years of written history gives Chinese medicine a real pinpoint on energetics in the body. And what they figured out was this concept of meridian channels. And these are energetic flow patterns through the body, right? And what they also figured out is that the furthest you got away from the source, the easier it was to read the energetic patterns. Hence, pulse diagnosis. Pulse diagnosis is close to the turnaround point. So I'm going to keep bringing this idea of this turnaround point. This is the place where you can read the body the most accurate. So the pulse diagnosis. And each one of these, you know, some people were coming up to me with um, saying, oh, I got a headache yesterday. And I was like, well, you know, the, the gallbladder meridian has two points here and here that are the final point is up here in the temples and in the back of the neck. And most Northern Europeans have a hot liver, hot gallbladder, energetic which makes it very common for them to get this kind of pressure headache like this because they got heat rising. So just a simple map, a simple hack, I can go, oh, heat rising, hot gallbladder, what do I do? I don't just work on the symptom, I realize I gotta tone the gallbladder, deal with the fat metabolism, shift the body. And most of these people are getting these headaches during pressure changes, during seasonal changes, right? So what does that say? The gallbladder is a barometer that helps tell the, the pressure change around us. So quick hack, easy. I can look at the pulse and I can be like, whoa, you got this elevated liver pulse, bounding liver. You know, the, the pulses also have a deeper pulse. So these are simple. You don't need to be a practitioner. The reason why I want to share these maps with you is because I believe we're in an age now where we want to test ourselves. We want to play with this stuff ourselves. And all of this is quick, easy access on Uncle Google. Your pocket god, this guy right here, he can, you can worship that all you want and find all the answers if you know the questions to ask. So this other concept that I brought up that I want to just share with you is the age of capitalism is gone. It's over. We're now in this age of collaborative commons. And it's really this, this shifting where we now can take a lot of the power back into understanding that we're reaching zero marginal cost. To learn this stuff is about 11 cents worth of library fees, you know, or free on the internet. So you can access this if you know the questions to ask. So rather than than um, looking for information. The information age is done. There's too much information, it's overload. Look for imagination, look for creativity, look for questions to ask, questions to ask. The things you want to create in the world come from that, not from the information you find, but from having the right questions to ask. So we look, at, oh, I keep doing that, this way. All right, so look at the feet. There's an entire map of the body on the soles of your feet, your soul. 
has a map. Go figure. You know, very easy. Um, I, I see a lot of women who have uh, PMS problems. And guess what? Right up, I think I got a laser here. Right here is um, the number 56. It's the pelvis and the vagina area. But then as you go up, there's the urethra tube. And if you put your fingers right here, when a woman is in menstrual pain, in those on both sides of the ankles, and you dig in your fingernail and hold it for a second, it will shift the pain right away. You know, it, it unblocks the stagnation. And um, Tiamu was talking about all life is about balance in his talk before. And that's so true. That is so accurate to, to the truth of health, is that finding balance. Stagnation, there's this idea, and it's that stagnation is the enemy. And stagnation creates friction, right? You guys know about friction? Friction creates heat. Heat creates inflammation. Inflammation creates response to the body. It creates a signal that's sent to the brain that says, whoa, 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 there's something inflamed here. If you don't respond to that, you get disease. Simple enough, that's it. That's all we need to know is that look for the imbalances. So these maps help us find those. Oh, uh, this way. Same with the hands. Sorry, I just want to say the same map, the turnaround points, right? The feet and the hands are the turnaround points where you can find these maps. Pretty cool. Same with the face. We've got a whole mapping system built into our face. And when you look at face energetics, it's really interesting because there's a lot of different versions of face energetics, but you know why people like Superman and Batman? They have the pitta, strong earth chin. You know the big chin that says, I am a warrior and I will protect you, but I'm also quick to anger, right? Whereas the Joker or these other bad guys in the comic books, they have the little conniving pointy chin that says, hey, I'm a schemer and I'm here to get you. <laughs> you know, so this basic energetics um, tells us the archetypes of all these different things. And these are common knowledge in our body. We pattern recognize. We're one of the best pattern recognizing organisms on the planet. And our ancestors have developed multiple maps to hack that. We look at the Native Americans in North America and they have these high arched cheekbones, and it's very indicative of, um, of the adventurer, of the wanderer, right? Anyway, each, you can look at your own face and figure this out a little bit for yourself, but the same map is in your ear. Again, turnaround points. The further you get from the source, the easier it is to read the patterns, because the patterns start like this, and they kind of move out into this kind of slower oscillating rhythm. So the further you get, the easier it is to read. Hence why we can read the stars, we can read the feet, we can read the hands, we can read the face. These are the points of our star. Oh, man. The next one is the tongue. And I was reading somebody's tongue last night at the party, and it was, it was just showing his friends how obvious it was to see the chi-deficient tongue with the scallops on the side of his tongue, with the pale, poor circulation, you know, kind of type, type of tongue. You can look at this, again, find that on the internet. Go out in the netherverse. You have a question, you want to know about tongue diagnosis? This is one of the simplest ways. But I want to just share with you, with all these maps, it's, it's, we're not for sure until we're for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, right? Which means each one of these gives me a question to ask, and then I can look at the pulse, I can look at the eyes, I can look at the tongue, I can look at the feet, I can look at the body energetics, I can ask some questions, and now I have an understanding of the way this body shows up. And you can do this simply without going to school to learn this, just by spending a few hours learning it on the internet. Wow, keep going, huh, there we go. Iridology, we have a map in our eyes. Eyes, they say, are the window to the soul. Well, there's not only a map in our eyes, there's also a map in our sclerotia, which is the white part of our eyes. And each one of these archetypes of eyes has a different constitutional setting. There's a really quick hack um, around eyes, and there's two different main types of eyes. There's one called a stream, which is this, this fine, fine type of weave, there's one called a flower, which is more like this type of weave or this type of weave. And the stream people, they want clinical data. They want information from a scientific force. They want to read it themselves and figure it out. They're more, I want to figure this out. Whereas the flower type of eye often wants to hear a personal story. They want you to tell you, how did this work for you, right? Very simply, an easy energetic hack that you can just look at somebody's eyes and be like, ah, now I know how to share and convey this information. Because... How we convey it is as important or more important than anything. So simple, but there's the inner part of your eye right here is all your digestive tract. And it's, that's the easiest part to read. So if you're first wanting to like play with iridology, start with the inner part 
And around the autonomic nervous wreath is all of the glands and all of the endocrine system. So we've got all this endocrine system, but then we go into the various body systems, you know, and they fit exactly how your physiology is fit. So all you need to know is just know the physiology. Okay, you know, kidneys are here, organizing down to, you know, and the adrenals are right above them. You know, we've got the liver on this side. We, you know, anyway, very simple. We can start to get the heart over on this side. We got the, you know, anyway, so it's, it's all actually pretty intuitive, and you don't need to know the science to be able to under, understand it. But what you need to do is change your sensory gating channels. This is very important to be able to, to step out of what you think you know and move into a feeling body. And we're going to talk about that as we go along. So these maps are some of the old world mapping systems. And every culture had their own wheel, their own system of understanding the, the nature of how it moved and all the seasons, right? So each season has its own different type of energetics. So it's not just understanding the body, it's understanding how the body relates to the environment around it. And this is all really key and really important because right now, for example, we're in lung season, you know? And lung season is autumn. It's also drying. The emotion of grief, we're letting go of the season. We have this grief, but it also the lungs we get sick in this time, and it affects our skin and our nose and our hairs. So we have to protect. We need defensive qi. They call it wei qi in Chinese, which is our protective qi, and it's all based on our skin. So when we get sick, it's not just our skin. It's our internal skin, too. So remember I said you're the hole in your donut? Think of your inside as also your skin, right? So we can start to quickly hack that. It means, oh, I should eat more spicy foods, warm carminative foods to move that around. I also need to work with my elements of letting go at this time of the year. So simply, I can take that medicine map, I can overlap it onto this one and be like, oh, okay, it's also fall here and we got a dry air energy. Mind movement, monkey mind. I'm more likely to get into monkey mind at this time of the year. Thinking, churning, wanting, doing, wishing there was more, grieving about the fact that I didn't, I can't live summer anymore. The weather is damp. Okay, so the next. I wanted to give an example of today. The rune for today is Othila, or for this hour, right now, which is honoring our ancestors, which is fitting to this talk. You know, this is a quick hack for today. We're in the fire time. This is the light time. This is our digestive time. It's in the, the heat time, the heart time, bitter joy time, the, the emotion of joy. Today is also a waning moon. Um, you can look at the cleansing your negative habits. So throughout this time, if we look at the moon cycle, we also understand that we have waxing and waning. Our ancestors were very clear on this idea of the waning was shedding off, letting go. So here we are in this moment, churning out and letting go of what no longer serves us. We also have Samana Santa coming up, which is the Day of the Dead and or the Halloween. We're, we're moving into the thinning of the veils. So where, where the, the space between us and the old world of the dead is closer. And whether you believe this or not, it doesn't even matter because what really matters is that these energetics are gonna slowly overlap, overarch onto the way you start to feel. All right, so what I believe in is your outer world is a direct, or your inner world is a direct reflection and your outer world, these are both the macro, uh, the macro and the micro cosmos. So I like to think of this idea of awakening your inner self. And, and I put S in uh, brackets here because I think it's your spiritual elf, right? Which is what connects to all of these things. So awaken your spiritual elf. Oh, why does it do that? There we go. Okay. So remember I, I, sort of the, the, the pocket god and this idea of this holds all the information? Well, actually our fingertips are deeper connected to the ancestral wisdom and there's so much more information in our fingertips than there is on our pocket gods the way we feel, the way we connect. And these are, are connected to the 13 mothers of the world, to history and her story. These fingertips tell us all about the history, our genetics of how we came to be in this place. We can remember so much of this information by using our fingertips. When we start to learn how to subtly tap in and change the sensory gating channels to access our fingers properly, that's when the pulses come. I was hanging out with my dad, and he's a herbalist, uh, 40 years, Dr. Terry Willard, amazing herbalist in Canada. He's been, you know, definitely won multiple awards on the Canadian Herbalist Association Hall of Fame, has been the past president there. And um, it was interesting because he was reading my aunt's pulse the other day, and he's like, oh, I know that pulse. Right away, I know that pulse. That's the pulse of your mother. And his, my, his, her mother has been dead for, for 35 years, 37 years, but the fingers 
remembered the pulse, right? The fingers understood that. He had no idea where it came from, just boom, from the universe, I remember that feeling. These fingers can hold so much intelligence in them. And once we start to, to change the gating channels, when he taps into pulse diagnosis, all of a sudden, he's not present looking at you, he's feeling you. And that memory stays. So this is a really important concept that your fingers are more, more intelligent than this thing. Okay. So the earth is more than just a home. We know this. It's a living system and we're part of it. But what part are we of it? We're not dominating this living system, right? We need to get back into what I call coherence, back into flow with the living system that we live in. And let's start with where we came from and what it is. Did you know that 85% of the history of this planet was microorganisms? 85%. I'm talking basically all of history, other than this little, little blip where plants and animals came along onto the map. So life evolved for 85% of the timeline in the microorganism world. That's huge to think about. That's where intelligence came from, the true intelligence. And these microorganisms form highly intelligent networks. They are way more intelligent than we are, by far. And what's information interesting is that they have open source technology. They were built with this, freely sharing information with, them, with each other. They created this open source networking system. So in 1942, they discovered penicillin and came up with the first antibiotics. By 1947, 65% of the Staphylococcus that, were, um, that were, the penicillin was designed to kill were immune to it. By the year 2000, we've been dumping, I think it's something like 20 million tons of antibiotics on the planet annually. Massive amounts. We've been doping up this planet, stupefying the bacteria, and they are pissed off. Right away, they started figuring out. In 1942, once the first antibiotics came out, they started figuring out how to work with these and how to build around them and how to adapt to them. In fact, there's some, microbi or some bacteria that actually use antibiotics now as fuel to create new, new life. Did you know that, the, that pharmacies have stopped, or pharmaceutical industry has stopped producing new antibiotics? They'll still sell them to us for as long as we'll accept the whole war on bacteria. But what they found is that every time they produced a new antibiotic, the bacteria would adapt to it rapidly and create, if they reverse engineered the bacteria, they'd find 10 new antibiotics they never even thought of. They just reverse engineer these super bacteria and they can find all these new antibiotics. So they no longer spend any money on researching these new ones. We lost this war before we started. This war against bacteria was a silly, silly human ploy to dominate the world, and we just are not that intelligent. We just don't share the information quick enough. We don't respond rapidly enough. The response rate of bacteria is so much higher, they're so much more intelligent, their networks, than we give them credit for. And not only that, they dominate the landscape. 27 to 33% of the biomass of our planet is bacteria. That means of life on this planet. Not only are they 85% of the history between fungi and bacteria, they're also most of the biomass. Between them and our next best friend, fungi, which are 25% of the biomass, that's over 50% of all life on this planet is basically these organisms. Both of them have open source technology. Both of them rapidly adapt. Both of them create massive networks that respond. We call this the wood wide web. Has anybody heard of the Wood Wide Web? It's nature's internet. It was here way before we were. And they even have Bluetooth technology. They have the ability to transfer information through the air to each other. The Wood Wide Web is a mycorrhizal connection that every plant, every other organism, every organism has a connection, which is mycorrhizal means roots and mushroom. Basically, myco mushroom, rhizo root. And we think that plants get all their nutrients from the soil, from the roots. That is so far from the truth. Realistically, those, those roots hold them in the ground and pull a little bit of nutrients in, but it's the mycelium wrapped around them that bring the nutrients to them, right? So these mycelium can travel far distances. There's some mycelium that are over 35 acres wide, one, one my, my, mycelium culture, and 1,500 years old. 30, like hundreds of tons of weight. We think a whale is big. Well, these, these mycorrhizal networks are massive and they're intelligent. They're old, they're wise. They know everyone in the forest. They know everyone before the forest even was there. So the other thing that's really cool about fungi 
is that we share up to 67% the same DNA as fungi. Now that's massive. That means they're more self-similar to us than plants are, which means they get similar diseases, similar different things. So when I talk about medicinal mushrooms, often that's really what I'm, what I'm understanding is that they've figured out strategies to deal with the pathogenic organisms of our planet, to deal with disease. So I don't think of health as this protect myself against the universe. I think of educate my body, build resilience, and I'm not afraid of the universe anymore. I am now fully confident that I can go out into a crowd full of sick people and my protective Wei Qi is strong enough that I'm not going to get sick. And if I get sick, so be it. It's probably because I'm sleep deprived or I'm run down or I'm stressed out. And that's my own fault. That's not the sick people around me's fault. That's the fact that I wasn't taking care of myself properly. So building our Wei Qi means symbiosing with the right organisms. And we, we heard about the microbiome yesterday. So that's a big piece of it is building the right networks with the organisms. Now, I would love to talk about fungi for three, four, five, six hours more because they're my favorite, favorite topic. And I know there's some fungals and fungis out there. So hit me up if you want to hear more about that because the medicinal mushrooms, in my opinion, are the top allies that we have access to on this planet. And they are just so far more powerful than we understand. They're mutable and they're this, this immune modulatory. So they don't just work for, for uh, lowered immune system, they work for autoimmune system. Plus, they help create prebiotic function in the gut. So they build our resilience. It's like college education. So I'm not going to go too further than that, but just know that these are some of the most antipathogenic organisms. They create these networks under the ground. And I'll, I'll, I want to actually touch one more thing on the Wood Wide Web that I think is really cool. They've been doing some science on this, and they've been studying trees. And they're like, how does a tree produce uh, how does a baby tree grow up? It's like, there's no way this baby tree can grow up. These little Douglas fir trees, they're underneath this canopy where it's all dark, right? There's no way to get photosynthesis, right? So what they've realized is that mother trees nurse the young. And they actually, trees nurse the young through the mycorrhizal networks. So through these mycelial networks, they nurse the young until the young get to a certain height, and then they stay there for years and years and years. No more nursing. You're at that age. Time to wean you off. And then when that tree falls out into the wood, the next one is ready to jump up and take its place. So they're sitting almost dormant for years, waiting to get that open space in the forest. The other thing is when bugs nibble on plants, they send chemicals through the mycorrhizal networks to, to the trees on the other side so they can start building up the chemistry to protect them. So these are the information superhighways. And all these mycorrhizal networks are built with 80% information going this way and 20% feedback loop. So it's this continual shifting of information across where we're turning. It's, anyway, I've got to stop because I'm going to run out of time on that one. Um, so six tips on building the gut intelligence. And I call it intelligence I want you to know that when you put food into your mouth, right, it goes into the hole in your donut, but we think of food as chemistry and we think of it as all these different things. I like to think of food as intelligence about the world around us. So just like you might come to this talk to learn about something, our body, how it learns is by reading the chemistry, the degrees and angles and branches of the food we put in our body. And this is how we build gut intelligence, putting foods in it that are gonna build the intelligence of the food. So that little apple that's falling on the tree, when I first came to Finland, which I love this country, by the way, when I first came here, you know, I went foraging just to like eat some weird little crab apples. I thought that was the best thing I could ever find. Why? Because it's teaching me about the intelligence of how to show up in Finland versus a coconut water, which teaches me about how to be canned in the Philippines and fly across the world and land here at the Biohacker Summit. No, but realistically, I want to learn from the crab apple. So, okay. First thing, this is super important, two-phase SIBO and candida. SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. These are the two epidemics that are killing us right now. They are the biggest health issue. Many of your other health issues will go away if you can get rid of your intestinal uh, gang-filled neighborhoods, as I call them. You know, people talk about bringing probiotics into the body. I am not a fan of probiotics. I think it's like sending yuppies into a gang-filled neighborhood with a pocket full of cash and telling them, build condos. They are not going to do that. What's going to happen? They're going to get robbed and mugged and taken advantage of. And that's why I don't, build, I don't take probiotics. I take prebiotics. And those are things like broccoli stems and cauliflower and all these things. And, you know, people talked about that already in other talks, so I'm not going to go into there. But the medicinal mushrooms are a great organizer of the prebiotics. they got these deep branch polysaccharides that help ground them back into the body. So that's one piece. 
I talk about permaculture design on the gut. You know, we look at how we've clear-cut the forests. We've done the same thing inside. We've created this culture of yeast and uh, advantageous bacteria that live on the sugars, right? It's the number one street drug on the planet, sugar. Anyway, I look for foods that I call levity foods. This is very different than what calorie contents they have, what proteins they have. Do they have levity? And what I mean is, you know how gravity is this force we give all this energy to? Well, the opposite of gravity is levity, and that is you pumping blood up through the body. You are essentially levity. To feed the levity, you need levity foods. Very simple concept. Doesn't need a whole lot of science. Just a, what has energy to it? What is real? This is why the raw food movement did such a great thing for a while, but it's not sustainable in this kind of culture. So there's what has levity and then what's seasonally appropriate with that type of levity. So with the mushrooms, they eat the trees, and the trees are the highest source of levity on the planet, hence why they produce some of the best chemistry. But going back to that, I look for levity foods. So fresh, organic, local, uh, biodiverse I want a diversity of chemistry to teach my body, and I want to listen to how the foods feel in my system. Now, I don't have a lot of time. I still got another three hours, but, you know, we're going to call it five minutes. No, three minutes. No, three minutes and 52 seconds. Oh, no. Okay, so tips for tending the soil of your heart cave. Now, this is important. The heart cave is where we start. So these are two of our major oscillators. So when I talked about the electromagnetic toroidal field, you have multiple other toroidal fields. All your electromagnetics centered in the brain, centered in the heart, centered in the gut. These are our toroidal fields that give us our feeling body. So we want to tend these properly. We can manage the brain, we can manage the heart, we can manage the, the, the gut. We start to build our awareness. So learning to trust your feelings is a big one. A lot of us get these feelings and we don't act on them. So it's just a big one. Also, starting to grow the ability to sense things for yourself. Not like, you can ask your pocket god and it will give you answers, but does that, does that resonate with you? Do, does it feel with you? Does your body feel that? When you put that coconut oil, for example, into your body, and you think, oh yeah, coconut oil is great high heat temperature, it's, um, it's good for the body, it, it helps thyroid, and then you look at the science, you're like, oh wait a minute, maybe those thyroid studies were done on Philippine people who were eating conventional diets and then turned back to coconut. Oh, now it makes sense. But does, does it resonate? Does it feel good in the body? Learning to feel and trust how the body works. Learning to feel your own heart palpitations. Starting to build mindfulness practices. This can be Qigong, yoga, nature walks, meditation. Anything you want. I'm not attached to the type of mindfulness. I'm attached to the idea that you tend the soil of your heart cave. That you give, and I call it the heart cave because it's this space, this sanctuary, this place inside of you that no one else can touch. No one else knows. It's an intimate, safe place for you to go. And when you build a strong heart cave, you build confidence in yourself. You build strength in yourself. You build awareness, and you build an authentic place to come from. And this is the most important thing you can do is to to come from the truth of who you are. If you're not coming from the truth of who you are, you're regurgitating information you heard from somewhere else. And this is a really important piece of building the heart cave, is to how does it resonate? How does it feel with you? And mindfulness practices, whatever they might be, are big pieces of this. So the other one I like to give is wide angle lenses. And this is slowing down, blurring your front vision, not trying to seek a destination, but going to this place of slowing that down. So I'm going to talk a little more about this on the forest walks we do. We're going to do some wide-angle lens practices, but I don't have a lot of time to get into that. Sit spots, this is a really awesome one. I highly recommend you find a sit spot, and that is somewhere close to home that you can go once a day, once a week, once a month, wherever it might be, sit in the exact same spot. Spend 10 minutes there, look at the nature relationships around you, look at the sounds, listen to the, the, the feeling, touch the plants, look at, oh, did a squirrel go by? Oh, where are those plants are? This one's dying down. When you build awareness in one spot, you start to see the seasonal transition, and the, you start to build this awareness mapping. All right. Oh, oh, oh. So I'm, I'm running out of time here, but um, our state of health is a direct reflection of our, of our reality, the way our environment is, and the way we perceive it. So you see these two guys? This guy, they're both covered in moss. And this guy's like, no, why is there moss on my head? And this guy's like, man, the moss is all good. Love it. Be the guy who loves to live in moss. Oh, okay. Come on. Wow, this is really fast. All right. So we must transform our feelings of knowing into ones of reverent astonishment and daring to face the only war that is worth battle of awareness here. So how can we interpret this with our technological mind, with our cyborg, so to speak, that we've built? 
This is the only battle I think that is worth fighting. It is the one of awareness, to build your sensory awareness. So we are warriors. We're warriors of the mind, body, and spirit. Anyway, I'm running out of time. That's it. Biophilia is something I wanted to share with you. Can't go there. I'm not going to be able to go into all of my reclaiming the roots, rhythm, and relationship, but I am going to say thank you for joining me. So have a wonderful Biohacker Summit. I love you all. Please find me on the Netherverse. I'm out there. Our YouTube channel is ridiculous. Totally worth checking out. And we got lots of information. So we see you soon.